just a uh, follow-up demonstration of some of the things covered in class as it relates to these initial drawings of the boat-like vessels or the boats that you're modeling in your studio. And uh, it's a kind of a continuation of the four-part series. We're just going to talk a little bit about just setting up main views and, uh, and then a little bit about extracting some of this data or some of this geometry from these surfaces. We've gone to uh, We've gone through a process that models these surfaces in a specific way, and we've been conscious of uh, how they look through their ISO curves. And uh, as I explained in class, one of the two reasons for that would be to locate the center line of structural members, so a frame. So you can imagine some of these lines, especially these lines going vertically, um, to potentially be locations where you would model a structural frame. And that frame would be, you know, holding the boat together, and it would also be uh, what keeps the cladding on. Um, so you can imagine these lines, these horizontal lines, potentially being uh, the start of these kind of long strips, potentially like a, like an old Viking vessel, um, as an example. Another way to think about the usefulness of these curves is just through pure representation. So. If you have to describe a surface through a drawing, a curved surface especially, it's helpful to have a very light layer, or a thin, um, a layer with very thin line weights that has uh, kind of an extracted wireframe so that you can see within the profiles where you may have a heavier line weight or where you take a section where you, you know, between the sections where you may have heavier line weights. Between that, you'll be able to read the surface curvature because you'll have a kind of a wireframe that's attached to it. Uh, it's just a, one of the techniques, in, in addition to shade and shadow, that you could use to create a kind of a technical drawing of a curved surface. So it could have, you know, some use for the actual construction, and it could also have some use for just pure representation. In any case, um, let's let's start with that. Let's start uh, extracting some some of the lines off of this for this surface that's already been um, modeled. I think in part three, uh, so you can revisit that video. Um, and I think part four then builds on a little bit more about what I'm about to say here. Uh, so you can also revisit that. Um, and it should actually demonstrate a couple different ways of extracting things from these surfaces. But, uh, but in, in any case, here's a bit of a review. Uh, over here I have a couple different uh, layers. Excuse me. So I'll head over into my sections layer for now. And I'm just going to type in extract isocurve. Uh, another way to do this is just to extract the entire wireframe. And let's say you didn't really care about which lines were going in what direction. You can extract the entire wireframe, put it on a separate layer, and you can deal with it from there. Uh, I'm going to do this differently, though. I'm going to select uh, isocurves instead, so extract isocurves. I'm going to select the surface. And you can see that um, because the direction U here is currently on, that I'm going um, selecting lines in that direction. Um, this may be different in your model, depending on how you did it. So I'm going to go ahead and click that up top there and go ahead and turn it to V instead, and that'll give me my vertical direction. All right, so I'm, then I'm just going to go through and I'm going to snap to the top profile there so that I'm making sure that I'm snapping along at least the isocurves that we had set up in this model. You could snap anywhere along this, so if you wanted to, to establish a different spacing, you can go ahead and do that by either dividing that top profile or you can just, you know, customize exactly where you'd like your sections to be by either measuring it out, kind of like what we saw in, I think, tutorial one or two, um, and intersecting that, you know, dimensionally with this top profile and finding your intersection points. For example, I mean, there's, there's a variety of different ways, of course, to, you know, space this out. But for the sake of, um, you know, demonstration here, I'll just work with the isocurves that we have. Okay, so I'll run that again and um, continue on. Um, I can then select my layer here because uh, I know the only thing that's on that layer are these. And for the sake of time, I could just mirror these around because I know that these surfaces on the other side are the same. Okay, and then I'll head over into my planks layer here and extract ice curve, change the direction to U, and I'll just go ahead and kind of. This one, you can use one of these sections actually to just kind of click down.
zoom in on that a bit. Okay. Very good. And again, for the sake of time, I'm pretty sure we can just mirror that around. Go ahead and select that layer. And we'll just mirror this around. This may not be possible, of course, if you have an asymmetrical vessel. Okay. And then lastly, you may want to, depending on the kind of drawing you're doing or for whatever reason, um, you may also want to extract the profiles differently. So for that, you could also just dupe the border. So you can type in dupe, or dupe edge, actually. Let's dupe the edges so we can select that edge with our profiles layer on. So I'm selecting the top edges. And um, just in case we need it, I'll select these outer edges as well. Basically, the, the front and the bottom of the vessel. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so that's everything now separated on different layers for you. And we'll get back to this in just a moment. The other thing I'm going to do, I have a camera uh, layer set up here, so I'm going to click that live and I'm just going to demonstrate a quick way to um, set up a particular kind of view of this. Let's say you wanted a kind of a, a top-down oblique view um, or maybe even a kind of a, a very specific axonometric view that um, you know you want to be able to re refer back to and maybe you have a very uh, specific reason for looking at the object in this way. You can you can you can model that view um, and I'm just going to just build out a a couple of construction lines here. Let's just say we wanted to have our view dead center. So I'm just going to draw a construction line out from the center. And then I'm going to draw a surface because the command that we're going to use is um, we're going to orient the camera to this surface. So I'm just going to draw kind of a, just a simple surface. doesn't matter what size it is. Something I could easily work with. Okay, there's a surface. And then I'm just going to center that surface along that line somewhere. And I'll use the gumball here to just kind of flip it up. And then I'll use the gumball again to lift it. And now sometimes what I like to do, and this is unnecessary, but sometimes what I like to do also is kind of put a little line coming off of this perpendicularly so that when I rotate it around, I'll get a good sense for how where exactly it might intersect the object I'm looking at. So I'm just going to hold the, uh, my left mouse key down here and find the line normal to surface. All right, and I'm just going to kind of select the surface and then find the center. Uh, now the line here um, can go in either direction. You can see that you can either flip the surface or you can just simply drag away. And I'm just going to exaggerate the length. And then I'm going to make a group of this like that. Okay. So now using the gumball again, I'm just going to sort of maneuver this thing around a little bit. So now I have a view that's going to be looking down kind of into the vessel there, as you can see again. Just a kind of a way of using a little simple construction of a surface to orient ourselves to the to the right view. Okay, so let's introduce that command. Let's go ahead and uh, orient the camera to surface. So if I type in orient, you can see that there's a few options that come up. Third one down on my screen at least is camera to surface. The surface again is here. Um, now pay attention to the arrow here before you click away. Um, and you can see that there's some options up top here. You could um, either flip or you can set the construction plane. What I'm going to do is just um, point out the fact that if you have an arrow that's facing in the opposite direction or pointing in the opposite direction of the direction you want to look, that will be that will work. Uh, basically, the, the the arrow is referring to uh, pointing basically at you, um, but you'll be looking back toward the object in that case. But if this this is incorrect, you can flip it. And you can see that it'll point in the opposite direction. So just for the sake of you know, demonstration, I'll, I'll you do that. And you can see now that we're looking up kind of toward it. You know, basically a worm's eye view, which is not what we wanted. Okay, so I can I can exit out of that just by rotating it around. I'll run the command again. Oops. And um, I'll set it this way. And now because that surface and those lines are on a separate layer. I could just kind of turn it off, and you can see now that we're looking straight down into the boat in this perspective view, um, but you know, down basically down the line. Another thing that we can do to make sure that it's 
uh, orthogonal to our exact view is to change our projection mode here to parallel. Okay, so this will give you a kind of a, uh, let's say a little bit more of a technical view, if you will, or it, it won't exaggerate or change any of the dimensions of the, of the vessel. It will just kind of give you the pure kind of oblique view. Now, if we like what we see here, um, we should name the view, so we should save it. Um, so I got my name views thing open here. If you don't have it open, you can type it in, or you could uh, click on this little options button here, and you'll see name views down below. So like that. I already had saved one, but I'll save another. You can name it whatever you like. Uh, and there's my view. So now, if I zoom around and I kind of begin, you know, if I lose that uh, as a as my view, I can always come back to it. Okay, so you can also make adjustments to it. You can zoom in a bit, center it, however you like, and save it. Is there a way to not, you know, it looks like we can just kind of save it over it, like so. Okay. Another interesting thing that uh, you might consider when you're setting up your views uh, is to see the camera, actually, in the, in the other viewport. So right now I've got this, uh, this Perspective 2 set up. And I'm just going to select in this four view um, mode here. I'm going to make sure that my the view that I want to see the camera of is selected. So you can see that that's kind of a bluish purple. And then if I type in the command with that select, which is camera, I could turn this on. I could show it, and that's going to show it in the other three viewports. You can kind of see that there. All right, it's going to kind of look like this. Um, sort of frame from which you look. If I um, if I make changes to the control points of this, you can see that I can modify the view uh, that we had just named. So now what we've done is we've basically just used the Orient camera to surface as a way to get started, but we're now able to kind of make minor adjustments. Okay, by use, just using the camera. So this is you know up to you to decide on what's useful. Um, use the four views, it could be a little bit finicky, but use the, the views to, uh, to assist. So that could also be, oops, it's all right. I'll just uh, turn that back to the right view. And I'll just turn this back here. So that could also be useful to you if you're trying to make you know, minor adjustments to the view itself. And then you can run the command again and turn it off if you like. Okay, so that's just a little bit about setting up views. And remember, you can point this view in any direction that you like. So if you're looking to create, let's say, uh, an axonometric view, maybe in a sectional axo, um, set yourself up with a view, either just roaming it around or set yourself up with a camera oriented to a surface, like I mentioned before. And uh, go ahead and name a couple different views. I mean, you're welcome and you're kind of expected in some ways to experiment a bit with how you want to set up your view depending on the object in this relatively simple assignment. Uh, just for the sake of fun, I'm just going to take this and rotate this over like that and uh, orient my view there just to see what it looks like. Yeah, so that's a good start. Okay, so you get the point. Minor adjustments. And then <clears throat> name the view. And then you can go back and forth as you please. OK. All right, so then lastly, I just wanted to discuss quickly, um, and again, this is, should be review, uh, just a way to perform a Make 2D on this surface. Uh, and making sure you get all the detail that you'd like out of it. So we've drawn this detail and you should see this in the drawing and you should have these on separate layers so you can adjust line weights and so on. So let's do a, um, let's go to this view for one and we can try another one. But you can see that, you know, what we've done is we've um, we've ex extracted these curves that were once just sitting on the surface as ISO curves. So let's take a moment Turn all those layers off, and I'm just going to do a make 2D of these surfaces to see what comes out like. And here, in this case, I don't have thin lines on. 
Ah, just an FYI. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the top view and at the object that we. So this is what you get out of that, right? So the Move2D is often going to only give you the profiles or the edges of the surfaces that you've selected. This might be okay for more boxy objects, but you can see you, you lose all detail. The curvature is very difficult to read, actually. The depth of this is very difficult to read, if not impossible. Let's try this one more time, but this time with both the surfaces and the lines that we want out all selected it together. Okay, so we've got these three layers and the surfaces, and we're going to just do a, do a window selection over all the top there, including the surfaces. And we're going to do a make to with that, the hidden lines off, and I'm just going to run that move. Okay, so now what you can see that happened here is that what we've done is we've we've now um, we're now seeing a, a much more let's say uh, descriptive drawing coming out here. We can now see that the surface has curvature. Or we can just simply see that the surface has some sort of cladding. Now it'll be up to you later to post-process this. You can see that there's some issues. You know where the surface kind of has an undercut or an underbelly. Um, those lines kind of stop. You know, so you'll have to either delete those, or you can just continue them. You know, draft it out in 2D. This is a 2D drawing now, so you can do what you please here. Um, also, you know, if this is an opaque material here, you know, you wouldn't necessarily see these lines, so these might be. Uh, dashed or something, but this might reveal the structure within. Okay, uh, and then of course you also have your profile layers on as well. Okay, so that's a nice, uh, a nice little let's say trick to make 2D. That if you select both curves and surfaces, it'll give you this kind of 3D rendition of uh, of the object and those curves that you've selected. Um, and then specific to the assignment here, uh, what we're doing is creating quick images that are kind of composed of both line work. Um, vector line work and uh, a simple screenshot basically as a base layer. So this is again where name views are going to be very helpful. So let's first of all take our make 2D layer here and turn that off. Going back into here and um, you know if we take a look just at this as a um, as a set of surfaces with the ghost of you on. Let's say, for example, that's the appearance we like, or maybe you can play around with the rendered viewport. Uh, you can also play around with just shading it, depending. I mean, this is maybe. The other thing that you can do is um, go into your Rhino options, go into your display modes, and you can do a little bit more customization if you like. I'm in ghosted here. Um, you can see that I've made some adjustments to the gloss and the transparency. You can play around with these to see what they do. Uh, you can turn on and off the S curves if you like, depending on the kind of thing you're looking to do again. Um, it might not be a bad option here because we have the lines that came out that we're going to overlay anyhow. So that might be a pretty good option actually because the, then they won't interfere. Um, but if you're just doing a quick screenshot and you'd like to actually show the S curves to kind of reveal you know, the curvature of the object, then by all means leave this on. Um, but for what we're doing in terms of a kind of a vector line work overlay with some basic shade shadow, this might be your best option here. You can also see that the other thing I've done is I've set up a white background on my screen. The way to do that is back in your options and under appearance and colors, you can change a couple things in here. Okay. Um, so let's go with that. And then uh, lastly, you know, um, uh, a way to uh, extract very high resolution screenshots from Rhino is with the view capture the file command. Okay, so view capture the file. Just type that in. What that will do is it will pull up this little window here, and you can change some settings. You could, um, now, by default, I like to turn off the grid, the world axes, and all of this. If you're looking to do some things like bring this into, let's say, Miro or, you know, our website or something, and you need a transparent background, then you can click that on. Um, here you can change the resolution, so um, if you go to custom, you could also, you know, lock the aspect and really bring this up as much as you'd like, you know, for example. Um, and this will affect how clearly this prints. So you should know how big your output is. In our case, it's eight and a half by eleven. Um, what is the DPI of eight and a half by eleven at three hundred? Sorry, what is the um, size, the pixel size of the three hundred DPI print at eight and a half by eleven size? You can go to Photoshop and you can figure that out. I'm just going to kind of type in this as a as an example. It will then ask you to save it somewhere on your computer. Just you know, you capture whatever. And um, 
take a peek at that. Yeah, simple enough. Not a whole lot going on here, of course, um, but you get the idea. But this is as a base layer, you know, as a way to get started. You could then put this, bring this into Photoshop, adjust it as you will. Uh, you may need to make some adjustments here, maybe even deleting out this line. You could also um, play with the levels a bit to maybe exaggerate the shade and shadow. And then you can bring that into Illustrator, overlay your line work on top, and create your composite drawing. Hopefully this is review. Um, if that process specifically is something that we should cover, uh, just let us know. Okay. Um, that being said, in terms of Photoshop layering, um, or sorry, level you know adjustments and stuff, you could also put out a bunch of different options here. You can put out this ghost of view, maybe with or without ISOs. You can put out um, a rendered view, maybe to add a little bit more, you know, uh, deeper shadow. You can also put out something like this, and you can overlay the two in Photoshop, play around with their blending mode, and you could then kind of decide later which ones and what opacity shifts and what kind of level changes you can make to make the image kind of uh, a deeper, richer, um, basically a uh, base layer. Okay, so again, that's just some simple kind of layer blending modes and um, and layering basically of images that exactly overlay. And I'm just going to go back in here just to turn on those ISOs again, just so I don't. Okay. So we covered a few commands there, you know, orient the cameras to surfaces, naming the views, um, and view capture file, a little bit of a make 2D kind of trick, and hopefully this uh, is a good follow-up to the four-part exercise and puts you in the right place for, you know, completing these uh, these simple composite drawings that we're, we're working on at this phase of the semester. And uh, just before we head off here, I'm just going to open up a couple more you know, to put a kind of a, an image, I guess, to some of the things I was saying about, you know, the quality of screenshot. Uh, here's just a simple, mo this is a, a model of a um, kind of a grouping of cylinders, kind of like the grain silos. And I took a cubic chunk out of it, and I've set a couple different layers here. This surface here is set to be in kind of a, uh, uh, it has a material of paint. So I set a paint material on it. This has just got a, a generic material, and there's also a wireframe view that's overlaid on top of this uh, by setting the object display mode. So here's another command you might play with. Setting your object display mode will allow you to set a different mode um, for certain objects depending on how you'd like them to appear within the overall global, let's say, um, view mode. So right now I'm in rendered view, but I want this object, let's say, to appear ghosted. So I can, I can change that, and you can see that here, uh, even though I'm in rendered view, as you can see here. The little fade action that I'm getting here, that's just basically set up really simply in using the Rhino Render options. So if I click on this little like blue sphere here, you'll see that um, I can have a gradient. I can change the color of that gradient. Um, I have it set, I think, to dark gray. I could also change it to whatever color. I can make it subtle. Uh, I think the, the overlay of grays here is quite nice. Um, and then just to say you could, depending on your view, you may want to turn on or off the ground plane, and you may want to have this just uh, uh, environment set up here to have skylight on um, without the sun unless you want some hard, hard more, more dramatic shadows. So by turning on and off the sun, I actually get a couple different options here that, again, I can take out um, by exporting a screenshot, and I can overlay them in Photoshop and see how they kind of, uh, how they work together or even just independently. And I'll just go ahead and view capture the file here. And here we're basically doing a kind of a pseudo rendering, if you will, because we have rendered view on. And this is a faster way of getting a kind of a diagrammatic rendering out um, of a high resolution that could be also be printed. So we can go ahead and do that. Take a peek at it. Very nice. Um, and just to kind of illustrate the point of having uh, some more detail, let's say, for your surfaces so that you can actually see them, here's a, uh, a similar model. Uh, and here's uh, also um, gives you an idea for the kind of chunk that I've taken out of it. 
what I then did is I set my view to match one one of these um, uh, section surfaces. So I'm looking directly into one of those sections, which will kind of, with parallel projection mode on, will kind of oblique the view such that you could um, you could hardly see, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, kind of like it removes the depth in perspective so we can kind of get a sense that this was cut orthogonally using a 3D object. Uh, this is just a way to develop visual interest. There's no real, for this drawing, there wasn't any real practical reason for it. Um, but just to give you a sense for that, um, setting up a view here, and I also have another layer um, of just these outer surfaces rebuilt, and the wireframe was extracted such that the outer surfaces you can see also in here and out here, those are the ones that are going. we're going to give some detail to so that when I do the Make 2D, I'll be able to very really easily kind of read the undulation of the surface. I have a few main views set up that we can take a look at. So there's one of them. Uh, this being another, kind of a different sort of elevation oblique, but the now we're looking kind of into the almost the plan, um, but at an angle because it was cut diagonally. And uh, here's just another kind of detailed view. All right, so just to give you a sense for how we could just use Rhino, actually, just use the kind of different visualization options within our live model in order to produce high quality screenshots. Um, you know. Of, uh, of these kinds of surfaces. So once again, I'll just do a view capture on this. And now, of course, your your bolt models are going to be a, a much more simple for now. Um, but as things progress, you know, this technique might be useful to get some quick diagrammatic renderings out the door. Okay, I'll kind of end it there. And um, and again, this is kind of a little bit of a hint, maybe, or even some inspiration for how you might even start setting up these drawings. Um, the two-view drawing could either be a combination of two axonometric views. It could also be a combination of orthogonal views, or it could be a mixture of the two. Uh, leave it up to you to decide. You can also explode out the wireframe and show that independently. But remember that um, it should be a combination of both this sort of rendered raster image with vector line work. And that should be compiled either in Illustrator, Rhino, AutoCAD, whatever your choice is in terms of compiling vector drawings with raster backgrounds. Okay. And that's it for, for this follow-up.